possession of the parts. Order. Arms. Ready. Face. Forward. March. and arms. Over there, arms. 
23 years ago, I was living in Orange County and uh, got a phone call. Um, one that I had, Mike and I had talked about often and uh, didn't want to come. Uh, and I was on a red eye out of LAX at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, at that time, with the information that we had, thinking that I was coming to a funeral. Uh, here we are uh, 23 years later, and what a great 23 years this has been. Uh, today, uh, three things are going to happen. There's going to be a remembering. There's going to be a remembering by those who shared his life and the, the moments, the defeats, the triumphs, and the impacts and knew him not only as an officer, but as a friend, and a brother, an uncle, cousin. Uh, there's also going to be an honoring. First, by those of us who shared his faith as Christians, for his faithfulness and a life well lived. Secondly, there's going to be an honoring by his law enforcement uh, brothers and sisters who recognize the ultimate sacrifice that Deputy, Deputy Severson and his partner Alan Alby gave that fateful spring day 23 years ago and that they face every day they get up and put their badges on in the morning. And there's going to be a see you later. Uh, not a goodbye because it won't be long till we're all following behind him. We're just a few breaths away and we will be reunited again. And to those of us who share his faith and, and his conviction, uh, we will see him again. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you on this Easter weekend when Christians around the world are remembering and, and honoring uh, your life, your death, and your resurrection. And Lord, we take a moment out of this weekend to recognize and honor and remember uh, Mike's life. We pray today that in all of this, that as Mike would have it, that you would be honored and lifted up and glorified. Thank you, Lord, for his life, his impact, and his legacy. And we just commit him to you that uh, how exciting it would have been to, to be there, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We pray for peace, comfort for families, and protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. Pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering and all the while, Lord, you hear each spoken need, yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. 
What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to find your near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? Well, we pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word was not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea, long that we'd have the faith to believe. What if your blessing comes through raindrops? What if your healing comes through? Sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near. What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to hide, we know the pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. This is not our home. What if our greatest Disappointments are the achings of this life, and it's the revealing of a greater thirst that this world cannot satisfy. What if, what if the trials of this life? rains, the storms, the hardest nights just happen to be your mercies in Please permit me for say a personal word of testimony. In all of my 55 years of ministry, Deputy Mike Severson is the greatest Christian I've ever met, had the privilege to meet. In the April 2004 policeman's calendar, there was a picture of Mike in full uniform in his chair out in the yard. There was an inscription inscribed above his head. The inscription said, the day I was shot is the day I found God's will for my life. Deputy Mike ran the race God set before him. He finished his course well. He fought the good fight of faith. 
he always kept the faith. He was a man who was looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross of death, despising his shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brother Mike endured his cross also. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, Christ, Mike is seated together with Christ in the heavenlies. Because there it says the believers are made alive, raised up and seated together with Christ in the heavenlies. I believe Mike will be rewarded with the incorruptible crown. I invite your attention to Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, he has not dealt with us according to our sins or punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. And as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. His place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his covenants, his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heaven. His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength and do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his host, you ministers of his who do his pleasure, Bless the Lord, all his works, in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. May God bless to our hearts his word. Amen. Please sing along. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Think like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy Now the lyrics are in your bulletins, if you grab your bulletin, open it up, and even if you don't sing along, if you'd read those lyrics, that'd be great. Read them along. 
Well, the sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing a no 
shadow of turning to thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Summer and winter, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in rest. thy faithfulness. Great is thy faith. Great is, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, to me.
Mike's family had uh, asked me to come and speak just a couple of minutes about Mike, so I thought that uh, I would focus just on what Mike meant to our department. Just a little backstory: uh, 23 years ago today, April 19th, in 1991, I was a reserve deputy for Burnett County. Uh, I wasn't working there that day that this event happened, um, but I knew Al Albee real well. That incident, that incident has has had a real impact on my career as a law enforcement officer. Um, it hit close to home and it made me realize that it can happen even in northwest Wisconsin. At that time, I didn't know Mike. Um, it wasn't until eight years later when I was hired by Polk County uh, that I met Mike. Uh, that came in the form of one of my first weeks in field training. The field training officer brought me to Mike, introduced me, and Mike kind of ran me through the paces. Uh, it was his deal. He, he got to meet the new guys, and... Uh, Apparently, I must have got the okay because 20 or 15 years later, I'm still here. When my FTO brought me over to meet Mike, he made it very clear that Mike was not a former member of the department. Uh, Mike was still a deputy with the Polk County Sheriff's Office. Uh, it was made very clear that we shouldn't ever even think of him as anything less. Uh, and I took him at his word, and that's how I have always considered Mike, and I believe everyone on our department thinks of Mike the same way. That's it's a little bit why it's bothered me this last week when I've read the newspaper articles and they refer to him as a former deputy, uh, because that is not what it is. Mike is as much a department as anyone sitting here today. And uh, it was... A little bit hard for me to read that, and I, I did make some corrections with some of the papers when they called. Uh, over the years, uh, Mike stayed active with the department. Uh, he'd come for meetings. He'd come for retirement celebrations. Uh, he'd show up at the department pictures. Uh, he'd even come for Weenie Wednesday. <laughs> that, that did seem to be a highlight of Mike's. Uh, every two weeks, we have some hot dogs for lunch. And Mike, uh, and this goes back a ways, in fact, and uh, Kitty was a big part of that when she was still with us, too. So we looked forward to that. Uh, Kitty did like to bring her cheesy potatoes, and obviously I like to eat them. <laughs> uh, Mike, unfortunately, last April, I believe, we did do another department photo, and uh, Mike was ill and wasn't able to make it. And uh, he was pretty upset by that. And we were always trying to figure out a way we could arrange to do another one. And unfortunately, we just ran out of time. Mike uh, was always welcome at the office. When he did come up, he always, we always had plenty to talk about. Uh, he, he liked to keep up with what was going on at the office. He wanted to know who was doing what. Uh, one of the things that stands out was when three years ago when I decided to change the striping package on the squad cars. Apparently, I was supposed to clear it with Mike, uh, and he wasn't real fond of it initially. Uh, he, uh, he did get used to it. Uh, luckily, one of our sergeants lives just down the street, cause, so he got to look at it pretty much every day. Uh, but over a couple of months, he finally stopped uh, busting my chops over it. <laughs> Occasionally, uh, we'd get into some, some pretty heavy conversations, usually law enforcement related. And uh, suddenly you'd realize you'd talk the whole hour and there's stuff waiting on my desk that needed to be done. Right now I wish we had that another hour to talk. People, uh, they've, al they've always commended us in our department on how we kept Mike part of that. But as I look at it, I think Mike did as much for us as we ever did for him. He... Uh, the strength and faith that he showed us every day after what happened to him was, was incredible. He, he reminded us daily that the difficulties could over be, always be overcome and that we should never give up. He showed us that the, a positive attitude could do wonders, and he taught us that life is about choices. 
how you can choose to be angry and bitter, or you can choose to forgive and make the best of your situation. Mike showed us never to let our situation define us. I have no doubts that Mike had his difficulties, and even some doubts, but that's where his faith stepped in. Mike never seemed to lose faith in, in God, in his family, or in his friends. He knew God had a plan for him, and he knew God had a purpose for him, even, even after the shooting. It's my belief that one of Mike's purposes was to continue to be an inspiration and example for all those who knew him. And he did this purpose well. The few minutes I had have, have come to an end. So in closing, um, to Mike's family, I'd like to extend my, my deepest condolences to all of you. But you do not grieve alone. Um, Mike's, Mike's law enforcement family grieves with you. We will miss the time spent with him and the laughter we shared. To Mike, I say farewell, brother. Rest in peace. You've served your community well. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Paul Rangel, and I'm Mike Severson's cousin. Our uh, mothers were sisters, and uh, they gave birth to us uh, two days apart and back in 1963. And uh, we were both the youngest in our families, and I think we both kind of felt over the years we completed both families. Uh, our families were very close, even though the Seversons lived here in St. Croix Falls and we lived in Minneapolis. Um, did a lot of family camping trips together. Mike and I went on a couple of ski trips together as well and spent summers up here in St. Croix Falls. And I thought a lot about it, the various things I could share with you, um, the stories that probably wouldn't mean a whole lot to many of you, and so I'm not going to do that today. Um, like the time Mike opened the outhouse door on me and my mom and dad took pictures. We're not going to talk about that. There were a lot of great memories of what we did together um, over the 27 years of his life before the accident, but I think uh, we would all agree that the last 23 years of his life um, made Mike one of the most remarkable people that we've ever met. Uh, because during that time, he was not really defined by what he did, but by who he was. To protect and to serve is probably written on a lot of cars in the parking lot. I know it's a, an oath of the, the law enforcement community, and um, Mike was not able to protect anymore, but I think he served uh, well, and uh, probably not in the way that he anticipated. Uh, Mike spent 23 years uh, serving us by showing us uh, many of the fruit of the Spirit from the Bible. And today I'm going to talk just about a few of those uh, gifts and spirits of Mike and his love and his joy and his patience, his gentleness, and his self-control. Mike's love. Mike loved people. Um, he didn't have the distraction of a job, and possessions really meant very little to him. Um, he looked forward to seeing people, uh, people because he realized that was his life. And he loved our family, and uh, when we couldn't be there, he loved all of you. Um, you were there in a meaningful and significant way, and I'm talking about the law enforcement visitors that came, as well as all the people in the community of St. Croix Falls. Uh, bless you. Uh, we really thank you for that. Mike loved you. Joy. Mike had joy. And I'm not talking about uh, circumstantial happiness, uh, but really a wellspring of contentment that came uh, from two things, I believe. The foundation of a, a family that was firmly grounded in, the, in a reverence for the Lord, uh, as well as the Holy Spirit that indwelled him as a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, joy, uh, joy came out of him in conversations that he had with people, and I'm sure that you are all were a witness to them, uh, to those, that joyous, those joyous moments with him. I visited with him the day before he left the hospital when it was uh, pretty clear there was nothing more that could be done with him. And it was uh, just Jane and I and uh, Mike. And, and you know, if I had to sit back and describe uh, his attitude at that time, it was lighthearted, if you can believe it. He, Mike had joy. Mike showed patience. If you think about his life uh, since the wounding, everything that happened around him was done at the timing and execution of somebody else. And so he learned to wait until others could meet his needs without grumbling or harshness. On a daily basis, uh, Mike learned to be patient and to wait. Mike showed gentleness when he spoke to the people around him. His words were deliberate and measured, and when he needed something, he would request it in a quiet way when the timing was appropriate. I'm sure there were times when this was not was when this was not was when this was not true when he was tired and perhaps exasperated. Um, 
and I'm guessing some of his closest caregivers saw those moments. However, um, his caregivers are here today, and uh, they're grieving as well because of the tremendous gentleness that Mike did have. So thank you to every one of those caregivers. Uh, bless you guys, too. Lastly, Mike had self-control. In Mike's case, self-control was not in his behavior, per se, uh, but his mental state and his outlook. Abraham Lincoln said, every man over 40 is responsible for his face. You know, when I remember Mike, I'll always remember his face. His face was our window into his self-control. His face was not worn and etched with anger and disappointment over the years about what happened or what could have been. I'm sure he felt those feelings over the year. However, when I remember Mike's face, I see innocence and I see kindness, humility, but also strength and resolve. Mike was responsible for a face reflecting a life of tremendous self-control with the help of the Holy Spirit within him. There's really no way to honor the memory of Mike without remembering uh, the 23 years of service of his brothers and sisters. As many of you know, Jody uh, built a house next door to Mike and cared for his needs for many years. Mike was, or Mark was already out of the state when uh, Mike was wounded, but he was always faithful to call and make visits. And uh, I know Mike greatly appreciated that Mark I don't know if it was because of the time zones or what, but he could make an eight-hour trip in about five or six hours. <laughs> These are all Wisconsin cops. You're good. <laughs> and lastly, Jane spent just countless hours away from her family, uh, seeing to Mike's needs. Um, she was Mike's primary health care uh, advocate over the last few years. Um, the three of you guys left nothing undone, and you're caring for Mike. It's been a real blessing to be related to you three. Mike was not perfect. That's reserved for the risen one we honor tomorrow. However, in my life, I don't know of anyone that endured more hardship in this world. Yet he served a complete 23 years to show us God had refined him. Mike showed us love, joy, patience, gentleness, and self-control. If you do the math, Mike spent almost 8,500 days in a wheelchair. And on Monday, he met Jesus. He's the one that writes all wrongs. He's the one that promises a new body in the afterlife. So 8,500 days will fade when eternity began for Mike on Monday. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sergeant Al Shelf in the Denver Police Department. And I had the honor and privilege of meeting to get into know Mike seven years ago. I was assigned to the gang bureau and as a member of our peer support team. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this service this morning. And I know that Mike's looking down smiling and is just as grateful, not for himself, but for the support for his family. My condolences go out to his family, friends, caretakers, and co-workers. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, touch a little bit. I've met a couple people in town that really weren't familiar with Mike, so... Deputy Mike uh, Severson succumbed to complications of a gunshot wound sustained on April 19, 1991, as he and Deputy Sheriff Alan Alby of the Burnett County Sheriff's Office attempted to arrest the subject wanted for a shooting in Minnesota the previous day. The subject's car was located near Webster Elementary School in Burnett County. Deputy Severson responded to the scene when the Burnett County Sheriff's Office requested additional assistance. Several deputies, including Mike and Deputy Alby, were approaching the subject near the school when the man opened fire with a 32 caliber handgun. Deputy Alby was killed, and Mike suffered a wound to his spinal cord, causing him to become paralyzed from the neck down. Other deputies returned fire and killed the subject. Many of us in this church are privileged to wear the badge that identifies us as police officers, sheriffs, firefighters, or paramedics. Roughly 765,000 police officers and sheriffs like Mike wear a badge. The police badge is probably the most well-known and recognized in the world, and like Mike, we wear it with pride. We are privileged because our society has placed in our hands the sacred trust. Every day when we pin our badge on our chest and go out in the streets of our city, we are given the opportunity to do good against evil, to make a positive difference in the lives of everyone who lives, works, or visits our communities. We get to protect and serve. Mike Severson, Polk County Sheriff's Deputy for 23 years, was the living embodiment of that motto. He understood that when he began his policing career those many years ago, 
They had been given the opportunity to make a difference, to make his life as a sheriff count for something, and he succeeded far beyond even his own dreams and expectations. The hundreds of you gathered here today are the living proof and recognition of that success. So what drew me to Mike when I met him? Mike was always a fighter and gave me the impression that if he was knocked down six times, he would get up seven. <clears throat> when first injured, a nurse at Craig Hospital gave him the advice, don't dwell on the 9,000 things you used to do. Think about the 8,000 things that you can do. Uh, in the years since uh, he was shot, Mike was able to do many things, hunting, fishing, using a sip and puff uh, fishing rods and wheelchair-mounted rifles designed by a friend who owned a sporting goods store. He's able to uh, bag two deer and a uh, black bear several years ago. Uh, his brother had said we couldn't believe that uh, believe he actually accepted what happened. Um, obviously it was horrible, but he embraced it, uh, what it meant to live paralyzed and kept caring for people and enjoying life. He lived independently and remained active in the sheriff's office. <clears throat> his big thing was perseverance. Um, his tenure at a, uh, Mike, his tenure as a sheriff's deputy halted after four years, traveled and told a story. His message was to show that there is life after paralysis. His attitude is what set him apart. Colorado was uh, like a second home to Mike, I guess you could call it. Uh, he uh, was there quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I think for the most part, all the experiences he had in Colorado were pretty much positive except when uh, John Elway and the Broncos beat his beloved Packers with uh, Brett Farr. Um, I know that the, uh, when he first uh, was injured that the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office really uh, helped to support the uh, family uh, and uh, getting things uh, on the right path for Mike. Um, I know that the staff at Craig Hospital uh, really is going to miss him. They were looking forward to seeing him again uh, this year. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, positive experiences I think that uh, Mike enjoyed while uh, in Colorado. In September of 94, Mike attended the funeral of slain St. Paul officer Ron Ryan Jr. And he was looking at the number of mourners and law agencies represented and he wondered at the time, would the lines have been this long for me? I think you know from the number of supporters how much you are missed. I'm going to just read a, a poem. It's called The Final Inspection. The sheriff's deputy stood and faced his God, which for all must come to pass. He hoped his shoes were shining just as bright as his brass. Step forward now, sheriff. How should I deal with you? Have you always turned the other cheek to my church? Have you been true? The sheriff squared his shoulders and sighed, no, Lord, and I'll be straight. Those who carry a badge can't always be a saint. I've had to work most Sundays, and I'm sorry I kept silent. And sometimes I've been a little tough because the streets are violent. But I never passed the cry for help just because I shook with fear. And please, God, forgive me. I've wept so many tears. I know I don't deserve a place among the people here. They never wanted me around except to calm their fear. If you're a place for me, Lord, it needn't be so grand. I've never expected or had too much, so if you don't, I'll understand. There was a silence about the throne where the saints had often trod, and the sheriff waited quietly for the judgment of his God. Step forward now, sheriff. You've borne your burdens well. Come walk a beat on heaven's street. You've done your time in hell. So in closing, I just want to thank Mike for being a part of my life and making me realize that things are as never bad as they seem. For the men and women in blue, it reminds us again some of the sacrifices that we make or that we're willing to make for our communities that we serve and that any day we go out there, it could be the time we have to give up our lives for our fellow officers or the citizens that we're here to protect. Thanks. My name is Mark Severson. I had the privilege of being Mike's brother. It's interesting when you come to things like this, you always learn things that you never knew. I learned that uh, Mike lied about the number of deer he shot. 
It was more than two. Uh, one of them he didn't want anybody to know about. I think it was the second deer he bagged. It was, uh, he called me up and he said, I think I just shot Bambi. Uh, he said, man, it looked a whole lot bigger in the scope. And uh, we uh, had a lot of fun with that one. So, uh, On uh, behalf of Mike's family, um, those of us here, uh, even my mom and dad, uh, they would want to thank you for being here this afternoon with us. Many of you have been there for Mike and for us for at least some 23 years. And we're so kind of you to join us. Appreciate a number of people who have come through these doors, so many friends and so many others as well. Uh, we uh, thank you, uh, Sheriff Johnson, for your words and thank you for the department, for all of you men and women that have served this county so well and have served Mike so well too. Wiener Wednesdays were a staple for Mike and mom and it wasn't the hot dog lunch that drew him and there are others here, there may be some dear graduates, other law personnel, firefighters. Thank you for taking this time on Easter weekend uh, to be with us in this place. Uh, we realize that Mike was family to many of you actually here. You not only share this day with us, but you too share uh, those moments of great grief and questions, those lapses into survivor guilt, right? and the longings for what we all wish might have been. But we also share something else with each other. We share Mike's story. For us, this is a day to express gratitude to God for his life and that we got to share it with him. And there are reasons to celebrate here too, many reasons. One of them is this, when what one young man had the power to destroy Thousands stepped in and insisted that he would not get the last word. One of our last conversations on Monday afternoon when things looked like they weren't going to be anything that Mike could rebound from, and he had rebounded from much, he just wanted to know um, what I thought. And uh, we talked about heaven. And I said, Mike, in a few days, we get to celebrate Easter, and I am sure as of anything I know that Jesus rose from the dead, and he stood in front of people, and he said, death is not final. So this is what I know. I know that the issues we're dealing with right now are not end-of-life issues. They're not. The only thing we're talking about now is end of life with the broken body you've got. And then death will come, and then life will follow that. And it will look, I think, like this. You fall asleep again, and then you wake up, just like you do any other day, and you realize your arms are working. And he said, Mark, explain that again. I must explain that two or three times to him. I said, we are not talking about end of life here, Mike. We're just talking about end of the body that has been so broken. Tomorrow, we will remember. Tomorrow when your church is the pastor, will say, he is risen, to which you will respond. He is risen Absolutely. Someone else asked this week whether law enforcement was something Mike aspired to as a career. And one of our family found this essay. I just have to say I'm a bit shocked. There was an A on it. <laughs> this was his junior year, and his modern comp teacher, I think, was gracious. The run-on sentences go on and on and on. But thanks to Mr. Boss, he got an A. And the, the composition was entitled uh, Police. And it is some 29, 30 pages long, which is probably explains all of the run-on sentences in it. 
But he describes everything about being a police officer. He's a junior in high school. And he comes to the end of it. And this is what he says. Well, what do we think? The policeman's job is to protect our property and to protect other people from the possibility of robbery. Yes, there are a few times that the police don't catch the person or persons that robbed someone's home or killed the store clerk and took the money from the till. But the policeman does stop a lot of crime that does go on. So now, what do people of the place think of the policeman that risks his life just so that he can protect and save someone from harm? Well, do they think that the policeman is all that bad? No, he isn't. He's there, and he likes his job that could kill him at any moment. Early on, Mike was drawn to this role in his community. And early on, obviously, Mike knew that this would be no ordinary profession. That the phrase, death in the line of duty might be used for an individual in law enforcement sets these men and women apart. And it explains why a community comes together like this on a day like this. And it is such an event. Mike held this important value. He wanted to live his life as a protector. He wanted his life to be spent for the benefit of and for the good of other people. Many of us would look at that and we would say, that's a Christ-like trait. And we're all made in the image of God, so why should it surprise us that there are men and women wearing the badge in our communities that have that very same trait and characteristic that's part of it? Sunday, Mike could barely manage the pain, and he was just dealing with the weakness, and the evening had come, and we had had a chance to be able to talk with him and laugh and tell stories, and Jody and myself and our kids were able to get there for just a, an hour or so and have a, have a vivid conversation with Mike, and then his eyes went up, and he was in and out, but he just didn't want to close his eyes. He knew how close he was, and he just kept trying to get his eyes wide open. And, and we said, Mike, I said, what, what's going on? And he said, I just don't want to leave you all. Can you imagine? There he is with a vent, working on his lungs, no ability to move. And he is saying to us, I just don't want to leave you all. And those were not needy words. Those are words of a man who loved so many of you and us. We knew it was coming. We could not know the heartache that would be part of it. There's a significance of that day 23 years ago, almost to the hour. Isn't that interesting? 23 years. Often people would approach Mike wanting to share his story, and they would often write articles and say that what Mike did on that day was heroic. And you know what's interesting to us? Mike never embraced that. He, he never embraced that word for what happened August, April 19th, 1991. He was of the opinion that he was doing his job as best he could to serve. And he recognized that that was true of every officer there that day. That Mike and Alan took bullets that would kill them overshadows something we all must acknowledge that street in Webster was filled with people just like the two of them. In fact, this room is filled with men and women just like them. Look around. It is reasonable to honor Mike and Alan for what they did that day, but these men and women, those of you in uniform here, and many more like you, it is fitting it to give you honor and respect and with gratitude. It is too infrequently acknowledged. There is nobility in your role. Oh, we know sometimes you pull us over and you insist on right behavior and we get a little grumpy. 
We get mad and get grumpy, and I bet you guys get mad too, right? Mike came home grumpy sometime. But underline all of the day-to-day stuff. Because you are willing to be there on days like the one we remember today, we say to you, noble, 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 noble is your service. We are here today because that shared resolve took Mike's life. He paid the ultimate price, and for that reason we do honor his sacrifice on our behalf. Well, heroic isn't a word that Mike would use for what he was involved with on that day. It is a word that many of us would insist on for his life the 23 years that followed. Mike's younger years were filled with a dream. Anyone looking for irony might say this dream killed him. I'm not so sure. We saw Mike live like few others. We regularly hear stories of the way Mike's life since that day changed the lives of others in profound ways. In some ways, his dreams were smaller than his life. Many of us had conversations with Mike that we planned to be for him. And we left realizing that they changed us. In small, incremental, but profound ways, Mike's life changed us. We were introduced to courage, to a sense of humor, in utter difficulty, to hope, to gentleness, to compassion, to continued service for others. Can you believe it? His caregivers would drag him out of bed, put him in a wheelchair, and he would get up to live another day. Mike was far more active than I was, and after he was Injured, I tried to be the good, consoling brother and pastor, which is always a dangerous thing. And I said to Mike, Mike, I'm guessing that your life now is going to have to shift from being such an activist, hunting and fishing and ski patrol and firefighting and law enforcement. You will have to learn to be a spectator. How wrong I was. He was heroic. I want to tell you what we're going to put on Mike's gravestone. It comes from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 7. We have this jar, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned struck down, but not destroyed. Three things stand out to me. One is the reference to our lives as jars of clay. God didn't intend when he made us to be ornaments, to be spectacles. He made us as jars of clay. Jars of clay are objects with utilitarian purpose, not meant to draw attention to ourselves. Jars of clay are fragile, And they're sometimes patched together. You visit Mike and you see his body there in the chair in his bed and you say, that's a jar of clay. But you visit Mike and you would also discover he would not want to draw attention to himself. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And that's what life looks like. The other thing that stands out to me is this this phrase, all surpassing power. Now, if you've been to the movies lately and you saw Captain America, you think you know what that means, don't you? I mean, absolute adrenaline rush, right? But we think Captain America, when we hear a word or phrase like all surpassing power, or we think of other mythical superheroes, but what does it look like in real life? When God told us that our life was like that and that we could have access to this all-surpassing power, come on, what does it really mean when you're not at the movie theater? 
And Paul described it well. The thing that God says that he gives to us, if we will allow him to, is something called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You could almost put Mike's name there. Not because he was great, but because he had access to all surpassing power. Who of us wouldn't want to have larger doses of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and (laughs) self-control? Who doesn't want that? And somehow... Mike found it. God, God's plan wasn't to populate the world with occasional and spectacular superheroes. It was to populate the world with people that would choose to invite the Spirit to give us that. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God. The treasure we'll be reminded of tomorrow when we go to church It's Easter and how extraordinary it is that Christ rose from the dead. This treasure here is not willpower. It is not the resolution that you and I might want to have to be better than we were or just as good as Mike in a particular category. It is none of that. The call here is not to ramp up being good. It's the fruit of the Spirit. A farmer doesn't go out into the orchard and say to the fruit trees in the springtime, okay, you guys, bear fruit. And all the fruit trees bear down and try to generate something. What the farmer does is the farmer ensures that the fruit tree is in a place where they have access to the resources and the environment where bearing fruit just comes naturally. It just comes out. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God. A lot is said about our need to have faith. Overblown, I think, is the importance of having strong faith. Underemphasized is this... uh, is a strong source for even weak faith. I, uh, I got clearance to bring, bring these in. This, the, these weapons are actually toys. The sheriff uh, cleared me for it. And just if you want to know, this one says on it, oh boy. That's it, right there. It's an oh boy. I don't know. And, and this one says on it, pat. And these are just, these are just those, those little pop, and uh, those little, you know, uh, captors, and you can tell these are all Mike's. Uh, th- these belong to Mike. But you know, when Mike went out on duty, he was never tempted to holster any one of these and take them with him. Can you imagine a civilian in trouble watching Mike walk up with this and, and then saying, Trust me, I'm a man of great faith. I think the civilian would respond, I don't care about your faith. Tell me if you've got anything to bring that's going to give me what I need. I think we overblow this sense of us being people of great faith and undervalue the necessity of us having faith in someone who can bear our need. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The real presence of Jesus Christ in a life to surrender to him is that treasure, was that treasure for Mike. My dad and I wondered from the earliest days why God never healed Mike. This was particularly hard for my dad. We were grabbing something to eat and we were probably seven, eight, nine days in. And uh, we were just realizing it was settling in that nothing was coming back for Mike. Uh, There was no uh, restoration of damaged nerve tissue. 
um, he would never move his arms. And for my dad in particular, he just longed for his son to have the dignity of being able to move his arms well enough to feed himself. That's all he wanted. He said, I, I just want Mike to be able to feed himself. And it never occurred. And while we were sitting there wondering, the thought came to us, well, well, perhaps God intends to show his power in some other way. And we gather together in this room this afternoon to say, God did. God showed extraordinary power. And we got to witness something more remarkable than what we could have easily called a medical misdiagnosis. What Mike had cannot be explained away. In our family, Jody has referred to Mike as our family treasure. And I get that. And it's true for us. But fundamentally, Mike was just a treasure bearer. And what Mike had, we can ask God to give to us as well. So that tomorrow morning when we wake up and we go to church and the officiant says to us, Christ is risen, we can respond in a way that may be more significant than we have ever meant it before. Christ is risen indeed. And we got to witness 23 years of the power of the living God living itself out in this jar of clay and realized that what Mike had, God wants for every single one of us. One of Mike's favorite hymns was the one that the choir from St. Croix is going to sing right now. It is well with my soul. You may want to sing. You may just simply want to listen as they play that now.
Jefferson. I'm from Denver, Colorado. And I'm thankful that there are representatives of the Denver area. I look around and I see all these people who are willing to give themselves, if need be, to protect us. In Denver, I've had the privilege of getting to know a few of the Jefferson County sheriffs. And you guys are wonderful. Ladies, you are great. Thank you so much. My brother was going to be here today, and he couldn't. And he said, Mel, please do me a favor. Tell all those men and women in law enforcement, the paramedics, the firefighters, we thank you. I'd like to close in prayer. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Our Father God, what a privilege it is to know that we have a God who loves us, a God who makes provision for us, a God who takes care of us, and has provided eternal life to us when we trust Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a life well lived by Mike. We thank you for the humbling of ourselves as we watched him persevere. We thank you for the example he set. Should difficulty come into our lives, we have choices of how we're going to deal with it. As was said, we can be bitter, we can be angry, or can do what we learned from Mike to accept it and to move forward being thankful for opportunities that we don't know are coming our way. Father, I want to thank you for the Severson family. I thank you for the example that they give to us of strength and perseverance, love, care to a member of the family, and to be proud to be a part of what Mike was doing. We sometimes didn't recognize it, but they did. Mike was in the process of honoring you by his existence, by the words he said, the deeds he was able to accomplish, but more than that, by the love that he was able to share. Father, thank you for the example that this family has set, not only for this community, but for communities across the United States. Father, we, we trust you in situations of difficulty. We trust you in, in situations of despair. We trust you in situations of defeat. And the reason we trust you is because you are a trustworthy God. You demonstrate it in each one of our lives, day by day, month by month, year by year. And you demonstrate your trustworthiness in a life well lived by a man who loved you and loved us. Thank you for Mike. Thank you for the memories we have deeply imprinted in our minds and our hearts. We love you, God, because you first loved us. Thanks for today. Thanks for the opportunity to acknowledge a tremendous life. Thanks for giving us an example of what it means to have 
a God who cares. Again, thank you for the privilege of being here today and to witness a wonderful celebration of a child that you loved. We pray it with thanksgiving. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
detail. Order. Oh. to attention and present four officers
Officers, order, hold. Each of the commanders direct your units to the order. Right shoulder.
Many men.